So I plan to make screencasts available uh, for the course so that you can review material, uh, but I don't have the annotations today because I can't uh, load it on my la uh, tablet. It's still loading, probably not going to load. Uh, so again, of course, there's the homework. Um, please limit your side conversations. I can hear you, and it's a bit of a disruption. Also, the microphone being used for the screencast is right there, and it picks up all the background uh, noise. Okay. So we talked about Haymarket and used that to motivate uh, this idea of observables and events uh, and stochasticity in general. Um, we also talked about how to read a mathematical proof, and we uh, did that through a demonstration uh, right from the book. We will revisit that uh, today. It consists of three major parts, the assumptions or axioms, a bunch of manipulations, and for those manipulations, it's important to recognize the context of where you apply them, and then the corollaries of things that follow or the consequence of those uh, manipulations. We also uh, talked about this third point here, uh, what a sigma algebra is. Um, the densest or the biggest, if you will, sigma algebra is uh, drawn from the power set over all the possible events. Uh, so if you're thinking about what, how to form that, uh, it's all the subsets that you can make uh, from the set of observable events that we're calling our sample space omega. But this breaks down when you're dealing with something that's uncountably infinite. Uh, the real numbers, for example. Uh, and the real numbers, we took the real number line going to positive and negative infinity. We marked the integers, the positive and negative whole numbers. And we subdivided the real number line. We can count those subdivisions. Uh, then we took one of those regions and we further subdivided it and showed that you can't possibly subdivide it to the point where you can identify the individual real numbers. It's not possible to do that. And that was our illustration uh, for what uncountably infinite means. And so this idea of a dense sigma algebra, the power set, if you can't even identify the observables in omega or sample space, like a temperature, 60 degrees, 60.0000001 degrees, how can you possibly form this power set if you can't even identify the individual elements of the reals? So that presented us with a problem, and we talked about the Borel uh, sigma algebra, where instead of taking the individual members of the set of reals as the things on uh, your index, you're taking intervals, right? Because you can count those intervals. And we showed with this example about what uncountable means. You can make intervals consisting of the space or the gap between the uh, subsequent uh, integers, right? So between 0 and positive 1, 0 and negative 1, uh, negative 1 and negative 2, and so forth, you can count those intervals. And so the idea with this fix-up attributable to Borel, someone's last name, called the Borel algebra, is to fix up this problem where this idea of a sigma algebra broke because you can't count uh, the real numbers. So we then ended with this first grade number line, and this idea of fix-ups in math because something broke is all over the place. And an early example of that was the number line, and when you learned how to add, they said, okay, you go to the left. So if you said one plus three, you start at the one, and you go over one, two, three uh, spaces to the right, uh, and it's a total of four. Likewise, if you subtracted, you learned that you would go to the left. So if you subtracted three from 21, you start at 21, you go one, two, three to the left, that was 18. But back then, they didn't tell you that there was such a thing as a negative number. That's a fixed set. Right? It didn't exist. All right? it, historically, it didn't exist. Someone had to fix up this problem where you couldn't subtract a bigger number from a smaller number. You ran out of number. Right? Uh, and so this idea of fix up is not unique to what we're doing in stochastic computing. It's all over the place in mathematics. And so uh, through some of the time in this semester and certainly in other parts of your math-related uh, education, you're going to see a lot of these fix ups. Okay? All right, any questions about this? No? All right, so I'd like to show you an example of an observable. And this one, I'm not sure if I showed this last time. Uh, this is the entry box of a retail establishment. And as you can see here, it's an overhead camera. And the entry box is that part we call the foyer. I call it the entry box of the store. And you see this blue rectangle that's superimposed by the surveillance system. And you might think, gosh, well, that's for loss prevention, right? Well, 
It's also for counting uh, the number of people that enter the store, so they start on the outside of the entry box and make their way to the inside, or the number of people that leave the store. And you'll notice here, uh, there's a statistic there, enter, with the number who have entered, and statistic uh, of the number of people, the counts, uh, of people who have left. Now, of course, the difference between the two are the number of people that are in the store, and certainly over time, you can track that and decide things like how many employees you need, how much revenue you're making during certain periods of the day. Now, if you can actually come up with a probability that describes the event of someone entering or leaving or the difference, uh, the number of people that are in the store, you can do a lot of things with the retail establishment in simulation. And the reason why you might want to simulate that is because with a simulation, you can ask it questions. What if I did this? What if I did that? Without doing damage to the actual store, based purely on the real numbers, the actual numbers that you measure uh, for your system. So this sort of thing is used all over the place in some supermarkets and warehouse uh, retail establishments. They track where customers are walking, right? Uh, and the idea is what is the most popular floor space in the store. Because certainly uh, the floor space that people visit more, you want to put items in that cell because you want to be eyeball on the product, so to speak. Okay, so this is a real example, and people really use this sort of thing to collect data uh, that they use as the basis of building models, the classic models, that they then simulate, and then they ask those simulations questions to make decisions. Any questions about this? Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, ah. I'm not sure if this was a coffee shop. I just put coffee shop because it's one right up the street and it kind of makes sense, at, uh, you know, uh, eating wise. Um, but this is some other type of store. Um, I think it's they're pitching it to coffee shops. But to answer your question, it's not inconceivable to have that many because if you look at Starbucks, right? If you look at the um, the drive-through and you look at the, um, uh, the actual store where people walk in, um, in any given 10 minute span, you easily have like 10 to 20 people. So it's not inconceivable over some period of time to have over 1,000 at the store. And certainly during certain times of the day, you're going to get peak hours, right? It's cyclical, right around maybe the morning commute, around lunchtime, uh, around maybe evening time before it's dinner hour, and if you're going to call it that probably around like Right? Now, each establishment is different if you're dealing with retail, like um, something like a local mall or a clothing store. The back to school time is going to be a big rush, maybe for a week or two from the back to school time during the holidays, certainly. And so, this is not going to be the same for every establishment, but it's not unheard of, even for something as small as a coffee shop, to have that many customers. Okay? Okay. So, I don't make up the numbers, this is just natural. Any other questions? Now, of course, if you're considering a career in you know, stochastic computing data analytics, there are lots and lots of retail establishments, and I don't mean individual stores, I mean corporate offices, uh, where people work very long and hard on these sort of problems because they're trying to figure out how to maximize revenue. Now, if you go into a supermarket, you notice the peanut butter is not right next to the jelly. You know, why in the world would they separate them? Because they want you to walk all the way across the store for the peanut butter to get to the deli. And the reason for that is that when you walk all the way across the store, you're more likely to look at other stuff. And you'll notice at the end of the aisles, the so-called end caps, um, you'll see these items that are on sale, right? Maybe turkey from ice cream is on sale, two for five. Or maybe Oreo cookies are on sale, three dollars, right? That's to capture attention, to get that impulse pop, right? To try to extract as much revenue, separate you from your money as possible. That's why they say, Always make a list before you go shopping, grocery shopping, and never grocery shop hungry, because you're more likely to buy something. There's a reason why at the seafood counter, when they steam the shrimp, why they vent some of that off into the store, because they want you to say, ah, oh, something smells bad, I'm kind of hungry. They want you to buy something, right? So you'll notice in the cereal aisle, right around three feet off the ground are all of the children's cereals like Lucky Charms, Fruit Loops, and, the, and so forth. And the reason why they're three feet off the ground is because that's a child's eye height. Then you have stuff like granola, stuff with fiber, you know, low carb, whatever. That's about five feet off the ground. That's roughly adult eye height, right? 
So everything is designed with data in mind, right? So there's lots and lots and lots of employment uh, in data analytics in all sorts of sectors. So when I say retail, I mean the corporate office where the research and development happens. Okay, so let's move on to events and probabilities. So let's begin with some casual uh, language here. What is an event? Let me ask you, what is an event? What's an event? Any, um, any intuition? What's an event? Yes, uh, JSON. Oh, JSON. I'm still learning the name. Does everyone have the same C? Yes. Anything that happens. Anything that happens. Okay. JSON says anything that happens. Yes. So suppose I flip the coin, right? So let's have JSON flip a coin. And, okay, let's flip. Did that happen? How do you know it happened? Not a trick question. What if I don't believe you? Did it happen? Prove it to me. You what? You saw it. See it, right? says, I saw it. Hmm, okay. So that's an important thing. Something happened, and you saw it. Oh, right there. <laughs> Something happened, and you saw it. Okay. So seeing is believing. You have to make an observation here, right? Thank you. The seven-year-old had dibs on this. So. Um, okay. So you saw it. So that means an observation is necessary for an event. It doesn't matter what happens. You have to observe it. And let's kind of bend that parlance a little bit. You have to make a measurement. Because an observation is really just you, your eyes, making a measurement. And the reason why I say measurement specifically is because if you're going to mechanize this, right, you have to have some other way to mechanize the seeing part. And usually you do that with a sensor or some other type of uh, device like that. Okay, so JSON flipped the coin. What did you see? You don't remember what it was? It was a tails. Okay, it was a tails. Great. So. The event happened, something happened, it resulted in something you saw. Now, it was a tails this time. Is it always going to be a tails? No? Really? It's not? So I'm going to flip it. Let's test that version. Tails, hey, it was the same. So it's always the same, right? No? It's not always the same? Okay. I just showed you, that's what you observed. Why isn't it always the same? Let me ask you that. Why? Why? It's not certain. It's not certain. Hmm. It could be something else. Okay. So that means we need to know. So the answer is no. It's not the same each time. It could be something else. So if it can be something else, that means we have to list out what all of those things can be. Right? What are all the observations that can occur? If we're going to deal with this thing that's not the same every time, some event that we observe, we have to know all the different possibilities this event can take on or all the things we can observe. So if it's not the same thing, how do you think we might describe that? How would you describe it? Pardon? There's a chance. There's a chance? Okay. But if there's a chance, how would you describe? Would you say, would I say it's always a tails device? I always observe tails? No? So how would you describe it if it's not always the same? What do you think? What's your intuition? It can be heads or tails. So you're going to list out all those things that you can see, possibly. Right? That's the only way you can describe it if it's never the same. So let's consider a different event. Let's consider rolling the die. Okay, so let's have someone else roll it. So Stefan, right? So Stefan rolled the die. So what do we have? We have a three. Okay. Is a die different from tossing a coin? Is it rolling a die? That's an event. You observe something. How is it different? The probability is different. Ah, probability. That's a loaded word. We haven't covered that. You're absolutely right, uh, Kelsey. Right? So Kelsey says the probability is different. Absolutely. They are different. But just purely at this juncture, we know that 
we had an event, we can observe something. We can observe a, we can observe a three right now. Is that different from flipping a coin? How is it different in terms of the observation? So with the coin, you have to tell the die to be one through six. Okay, so what we observe is very different. Now this idea about the probability, that gets towards this notion of difficulty, right? And we haven't gotten there yet, but you're absolutely right, right? The probabilities are different. Okay, so it is different from flipping a coin. Now, intuitively, every one of you has this idea, if we were going to gamble based on these two types of events, that the coin would be preferable to the die. And the reason it's preferable to the die is because it's easier to get it right. There are only two possible observations, whereas with the die, there are six. If you pick one, there are five ways you can get it wrong with the die. So let's think back to that gambling. What if instead of a dollar, if I said, hmm, you wager a dollar, I wager a dollar, flip a coin, and guess what the outcome will be. If you get it right, you keep my dollar. If you get it wrong, I keep your dollar. What if we said, roll the die, and we're going to have a similar gambling game and guess what the event outcome should be before the roll happens. If you get it right, you keep my money. If you get it wrong, I keep your money. Do you think that game should be different? How much should you win? Is it more or less based on the difference between rolling a die and flipping a coin? It should be more money. Why should it be more money? Better chance to lose. To win more. Yes? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Ah, you have more possibilities, but as the house, I'm going to say the house wins if you're wrong. So you get to pick one event out of the six. And if you're right, you keep my money. If you're wrong, it doesn't matter how many ways you can be wrong, I keep your money, the house, so to speak. Okay. So, We'll notice that the die is sort of a little bit more difficult. What if I kind of sweetened it a little bit? I said, you put down one dollar, I'll put down six dollars. Roll the die, and if you get it right, you keep my six dollars. If you get it wrong, I keep your one dollar. Which one are you more likely to play? The dollar coin game or that six to one dice game? Which one? The pardon? You're more likely to pay the coin still? Yeah. And what if I sweeten it even more? I said, because everyone has a point where they're still where they're gonna do it. I said, you wager one dollar, the same dollar, step right up, right? Like the carnival. And if you get it right on a roll, I'll give you ten dollars. If you get it wrong, I keep your one dollar. Would you still do it? Would you do the coin still? No? How about $20? <laughs> Wait, $20 if you get it right? If you get it right, you keep my $20. If you get it wrong, I keep your $1. Oh, I'll do the coin. You do the coin. Still the coin or the dot? Okay, well, wow. hard bargain. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly, the coin is easier to win. So if you play it for a long time, and we talk about this later, not today, but later on in the semester, when we talk about expectation, the coin is easier to win. But it takes you longer to build up that winnings. The die is harder to win, but when you do, you get a big windfall of cash. And it's, casinos absolutely have teams of people who figure this stuff out because the casino will never lose money. They always win uh, game money. Question. Can't you make the die roll the die the same probability as the coin by saying that if you roll anything between one and three? Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. You could do that. But then, what I would do, because you haven't taken this class, I would say you have to gamble $2 instead of 1, right? It's the same thing as the coin. And I'm glad you said that, because when you group it together, 1 to 3 versus 4 to 6, it's exactly the same behavior as flipping a coin. No difference whatsoever, right? So, you know, you, you know, you read these stories about people who, quote unquote, count cards in poker. All they're doing is computing probabilities in their head. Now, casinos don't look favorably on that. 
So don't go over to Dover Downs and do that. And by all means, don't say, so the home is told me to go do that. No, I'm not telling you to go do that. I'm just saying it's a thing, right? But don't do that because they really don't like when people do that for some reasons. That's probability. All right. So, yes, you can sweeten the pot, and by increasing the wager, right, you're almost paying for that difficulty. You're saying, I recognize the fact that the die is more difficult. And by allowing you to win more if you get it right, it's sort of paying for that risk, that very high likelihood that you could be wrong. Okay. And most games of chance are like that. Take, for example, like Powerball, right? You only spend $2, and you could win $100 million, wonderful. But the likelihood of you doing that is one in, I think it's like eight or nine zeros or something like that. I can actually calculate it for you. We can go over that one in the class. But, but it's really rare to win Powerball. But oh, what you win when you do that. All right. So we have this idea that we have these events, things that you observe, and different types of systems, right? A system consists of objects, they do something, events occur, and you observe the result of that event. So a coin flip is a type of system, and it behaves differently from the die roll. It's a different type of system, right? So we have these systems, they have outcomes, they behave a certain way, and we want to be able to describe this behavior in terms of the observations that we see if we continue engaging on these systems. All right. So how is it different? We already talked about that. So an event needs a bunch of things, right? We need something to happen. In probabilistic parlance, this is called an experiment or a trial. You do something. You measure something. Something occurs in the environment. You need an observation. You have to measure something, examine an outcome. Now, of course, because you can get an outcome, you need this third thing. You need these outcomes to occur at a certain time or a certain way. Now, I know we're all fairly young, but I've always believed musically um, that everything you need to know about life came from the 80s and the 90s in terms of music, right? And so this one is about probabilities. So anyways, you do something. You flip a coin, roll a die. Here's one. You take a picture. Do you know what the pixels are that are going to pair on your phone camera or digital camera? Do you know what they are? Anyone? No? I don't know either. Right? That's a type of observation. Granted, it's a very complex observation. There are a lot of pixel values, a lot of pixel colors. But certainly, this is another type of system. So, you observe some outcome, like the side of a coin, the side of a die, or maybe it's a 2D matrix of pixels from an image. It's not the photo of the digital camera. And given that we don't know which outcome is going to happen, the only thing we're left with if we're going to try to describe these systems well so that we can use them and recognize them is to list all the possible outcomes. So we just list them all out. So let's do that. So if we were to look at the coin events, we call one H and one E for heads and tails. Likewise, for the size of the die, we would call one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, of course, there could be that weird, freakish thing that happens. The coin lands perfectly on its side. You could encode that too if you would. But that's not going to happen very much. Very rare. If that happens, then you need to buy a lottery ticket because something is smiling on you. All right. So we list out all the events, and now we go to the tools for mathematics to help us write out collections of things that we can identify. We're going to use sets to do that. So here in set notation, we have open and close curly brace. Now, functionally, a set has at most one, so one of every unique type. So here we have the set representing the observable coin events, heads and tails. Here we have the set containing all the observable 
die roll events, one through six. Okay. Any questions about this? Make sense? Okay. So we have our sets, and let's now construct our sample space omega. Now here, mathematically, omega is the sample space, the list of all possible events. We're using set notation, but we're going to use a subscript coin so that we know this particular sample space omega, all the observable events, is for a coin flip, a coin system. And likewise, we say omega die to connote the fact that that particular omega is for the system called the die roll. Okay? So we have two sample spaces omega, omega coin and omega die, representing all the possible observable events we can see as a result of rolling a, coin, of rolling a die or rolling a coin, you can roll a coin, putting it together, but uh, of flipping a coin or uh, rolling a die. So now, I'm going to abstract from that. I went to the specific. Now let's kind of abstract more generally. We have some sample space, omega, and we have some number of events. I'll label the first one E1, E2, and so forth. So going back to the coin example, instead of calling this H, you could call it E1, the first event I can observe. You could call this, instead of P, E2, the second observable event I could have for the system. Likewise, you could say E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, and E6. So in this next slide, I'm being more general because you have to be able to generalize things if you're going to talk about them mathematically. So let's do so. So here we have a sample space omega, and omega has a bunch of events, and each one is unique. There are no repetitions. That's what the behavior of a set is. We call the first one E2, E1, the second one E2, E3, and so forth, and we have n many of them, little n, right? It doesn't matter if n is the hundredth one or the sixth one or the second one. It's just some number. Now, below that, I've written a set of natural numbers. One, two, three, and so forth. So we're going to take our sample space omega, and we're going to put them in so-called one-to-one correspondence with the natural numbers. So that means we're going to pair them up one for one. So E1... We're going to pair with natural number one. Event E2, we're going to pair with natural number two. Event E3, and so forth, up to and including the nth one. So one of the things we'll notice here when we do this pairing is that each event is matched up or paired with a natural number. This pairing is unique. And we'll notice that there's a maximum natural number that covers the last event in our set. Okay. So if you have that maximum in order of the naturals, that maximum natural number that's paired with an event in omega is going to be the count or cardinality of our sample space omega. And it's important to know the size, the count, or the cardinality of your sample space because that's going to help us formally define this idea that I've been calling, when can I see you again, the probability, right? Now, of course, for something like a coin flip and a die roll, it's very easy to think about. But it's a lot harder to think about, for example, let's say if I have five proteins, two starches, and ten vegetables, how many meals can you compose out of that if you need a protein, a starch, and a vegetable? So we're going to have to learn how to depict and count or enumerate the number of things we can observe, and we do it with simple things so that you learn the process such that when you get to more complex systems, that you can easily calculate that. Because you need to calculate it in order to start talking about and computing these probabilities. Does it make sense? Okay, any questions? No? Make, okay. So, this cardinality of omega. In this particular case, mathematically, how we notate this, or note this, is with these bars, magnitude, or cardinality. We could call it absolute value. But for sets, it's cardinality. For numbers, it's absolute value. Okay? So this cardinality of omega is n because when we draw one-to-one -one correspondence between omega and the naturals, the maximum one is n in the set of natural numbers. Okay? 
That's why the cardinality exists. That's what cardinality is. And in this particular case, it tells us how many different possible observations we can make. And so that's why we know a die has six choices. That's why we know a coin has two choices. And you might be saying, you know, well, that's, that's obvious. That's kind of silly. It's kind of stupid, right? Well, it seems obvious because these systems are simple. But when the systems get more complex, we have to follow a process as to how you get to this cardinality. Okay. So you start with the simple to practice the techniques so that you can apply them to something that's not so simple. Okay, so the basic number of members of a group are cardinality, and that arrives or derives from the one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit more complex type of system. So instead of one roll of a die, let's have big N rolls of a die. Big N could be two, could be six, could be ten. Doesn't matter how many rolls it is. So a more complex system is how many events are in the set of n rolls of the die. Now that's a lot more complex to think about, right? A lot of so-called moving parts. So again, the three things we need, and we'll walk through this, is that we have something that happens, okay? We have an observation, okay? You have to see something, you have to know what those observations are. And then when can I see you again? How often will they occur? We'll talk about those three points. All right, something happens. I roll the die. Now, some of you, well, I like to visualize things, so um, wrote a little visual. So let's say you roll the die n, big n, many times. So there's the first roll, there's the second roll, the third roll, the nth roll. Now, it's identically, or it's the same problem if instead of rolling one die, big N many times, you roll N die one time, right? It's the same problem. But in this case, to make it simpler, I'm just gonna say you roll one die, big N many times. Does that make sense? Okay, so if I do that, now the question then is what can I observe? Okay, that's a great question. So for the first roll, you could observe a one, two, three, four, or five, or six. Likewise for the second roll. You could observe the one, two, three, four, five, or six. Third roll, one, two, three, or five, or six, etc. Those are your observations. So that means we know the cardinality omega, a cardinality of omega for a single die roll, that was six. So that means for the first roll, we have six choices. Likewise, for the second roll, we have six choices. So for each of those big N many rolls, we have six choices. Okay. So we take all of those N many rolls. We multiply those choices together. Six times six times six times six times six multiplied with itself big N many times is the same as six to the power big N. Okay. So if we do that, that is the total number of choices we can get from rolling the die big N many times. Does that make sense? So here, we're using the base fact for a single die roll, and we're writing out what we can observe, and we're listing out all the different things that we can observe, and it's based on the choices that you have available. Does that make sense? Any questions? All right, so um, I was going So let's take a look at the expansion of uh, the n uh, rolls of a single die and get to why uh, that is six to the big n power. So here we have the first roll, roll one. We have the second roll, roll two, the third roll, roll three, and so forth, up to roll big N. Now, if we take a look at the first roll, we can actually draw all of the possible choices 
we have six of them. So there's the one outcome, the two, the three, four, five, and six. So let's label those. There are six of them. There's one, two, three, four, five, and six as the outcomes of the first row. Now for the second row, let's just assume for the first row we had an outcome of four. And for the second row, after that outcome of four in the first row, we have six choices. That would be a one, two, three, four, five, and six. So one, two, three, four, five, and six, and so on. Uh, let's say for that first row, we had the outcome of four. Second row, let's say the outcome was, uh, for example, five, right? The next row for that after that five is gonna have six choices. One, two, three, four, five, and six. That's one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, so if we, so the first row, let's assume our outcome was four. For the second row, let's assume our outcome is five. And we had a third row after that, and let's assume for that our outcome was um, two. Okay, so let's enumerate, or at least draw, the path that we traverse for those outcomes. So we started out the first row, and I'll do that in red, outcome was four. Then after that, we had six choices. And for that, the outcome we said was five. So there's a five, we trace that path. And then for the next row, the outcome was two. So we trace down that path. Now, if we were to actually count the number of paths we can have along this tree expansion from the first row up through the nth row, we have a total of six to the n many choices. So let's illustrate this with the first two rows. Now, for the first row, we have six choices, right? And after that first choice, if we had an outcome of one, we'd have six choices, two, three, four, five, six. For the second one, we'd have six choices, one, two, three, four, five, six. For the third one, six choices, one, two, three, four, five, six. For the fourth one, six choices that we have drawn here, one, two, three, four, five, six. For the fifth one, six choices, one, two, three, four, five, six. And for the sixth one, six choices, one, two, three, four, five, six. So here what I've drawn are the six choices for the second row that you can have given an outcome for the first row. So if we were to count just for these two rows, row one and row two, which I'm depicting here using each of these kind of bushy trees on the end of the outcome of row one, we would count all the possible paths. Well, for an outcome of one, we have six choices. For an outcome of two, we have six choices. Outcome of three, we have six choices for the second row. Outcome of four, we have six choices for the second row. Outcome of five, we have six choices for the second row. Outcome of six, we have six choices for the second row. So we have six plus six plus six plus six plus six plus six. Well, that's equal to six times six, which is equal to six squared, which is equal to 36 possible choices. And so if we were to repeat this expansion for each of these 36 choices, this would be um, path number one, going from one to that outcome, path number two, so this is the outcomes one through six, these, one through six, these would be seven through 12, and so forth. Right? And so if we repeat this process uh, going forward uh, throughout all of the big n many rows, we would find that we have a total of 36 path, uh, paths. And so that each path uh, from the first row up through the nth row, big n, uh, would number of paths would be a total of six to the n uh, many paths. And that's, each path represents 
uh, one particular uh, outcome among our n many roles. So that's why this is multiplicative, uh, because for each branch, if you will, we have six branches or possibilities for the subsequent uh, following uh, role. Okay, so let's go back and continue on. There we go. All right, back to where we should be. All right, so how about that? So we multiply all of the choices that we have uh, for each of the roles, right? So this gives us a total of six to the n choices uh, over those big n many variables. So any outcome can appear. So we also then, and this is the when can I see you again part, describe the percentage of the number of trials in which we'll see each one of those outcomes, right? That's the when can I see you again, that's the probability. So you do something, that's number one, the event. You observe something, you just counted all of those possible events that could occur for the big N many die uh, outcomes, uh, for the six to the big N many outcomes uh, of the die roll. And now we wanna look at when can I see you again? So this is to express the degree to which an event is possible, right? When can I see this event again, all right? So in life, you know, words are an interesting thing and you know, they made us struggle with five years of Latin, so damn it, I'm gonna use it as much as I can, um, bless you. So um, ity, iti, is a suffix that is used to denote the quality or condition. So humility is the quality of making yourself human, like the earth of making yourself low. Right? Not to be concerned to be confused with hummus, which is pretty good. Um, profanity, ITY, is instance or the condition of being irreverent or unorthodox in your practice. Right? So the word probability, right, the degree to which something is going to occur, the probability, right, comes from probable iti, and it sounds funny if you say probable iti. So they chop this word, the E off, and call it probability, right? That's where the word comes from if you're interested. Now, when you express a probability, it's um, expressed on a 100 scale. And the reason for that is that you have to register things on the same scale in order to make comparison, right? So if you said one sixth for the die roll versus one half for the point flip, you need to express it in a common scale per 100 in order to compare the two together, which one is more rare. So if you do that, you'll find on a per 100, the die roll is much more rare than the coin flip, okay? Uh, so the Latin kentum uh, means 100, and per kentum literally means in Latin um, out of 100, right? So here we have uh, the omega die roll is, has a cardinality of six, and when we see these event outcomes again, it is described in one of two ways. One is called random, right? This is where definitions come in. Random means that no one observation is preferred over another. That means they are equitable. They have the same rate at which the when can I see you again will occur, right? That's what random means, equally likely. Now the dual of random is called biased. That means some are preferred over another. So, you know, if you go into a casino and there's a quote unquote biased coin, that means that some sides are gonna come up more likely than the other. And you can absolutely engineer that if when you make the die, it's made out of sort of plastic material. If you, inside of it, there's a piece of lead closer to one side, more likely that piece of lead is gonna be face down because it's heavier, right? So if you have a preference for some things over another, some outcomes, that's called biased. But random has a specific meaning. So when you said I had a random thought, no, it's not random. Random means one out of every possibility. Biased means that there's some preference in flip. So if you have a random system, that means all of the events, outcomes you can observe, are equally likely. So probability by the 100 100%, you take one, which is the total amount of probability you can have, and you divide it by the number of observations that you can see. So in a particular, of a, uh, in a particular case of a die roll, 
it would be one over the cardinality of omega dot, right? So you could absolutely do this with the die roll n many times. It's a more complex event. And you follow that process. You look at the event, you measure the cardinality of all the possible observable outcomes, and if it's a random system, one over the cardinality of all the possible outcomes, right? So this is a single die. Any questions about this? Make sense? All right. So let's take a look at our more complex event. So we said that the probability, the, the, the uh, sample space omega of n rolls of the die, omega n rolls die, is equal to six to the n power. So in similar fashion, because this is a random system, we're not preferring one outcome over another, we you follow the same recipe. And that is one over uh, omega, cardinality of omega n rolls die, which is six to the n, so one upon six to the n, which is a very, very small probability. Because six to the n, even if n is three rolls of the die, that's a pretty big number, and one over that is a very small per pentum out of 100. Make sense? Okay. Any questions about this? No? All right. So, let's take a look at uh, sample space. So this is other machinery that we're gonna need over time. So let's introduce that now. We talked about sample space omega, okay? That's a set of observable events. We also have the empty set, which is the nothing event. And then we have this notation, probability of P, and we have this open closed curly brace with E, where E is an event inside of that. You can think of it as a kind of function call, and E is the parameter, the probability of some event, right? And that's how we express the probability of, that's the when can I see you again. So those three things we need in order to do our analyses, we have an event that occurs, we have the possible observables, and you have to count them, and then we have this per kentum probability expressing when can I see you again, each of those outcomes. If it's random, they're equally likely, so we express that as one over the size or the cardinality of our total sample space for that event. And it works for a simple event or the complex event. So these are sets, and as sets we have uh, to our disposal, at our disposal, we have all of the usual set operations uh, that you did in discrete math. And so let's say you have uh, two sets, A and uh, B, and let's, for the sake of argument, in the upper left-hand corner, your left, we have the union of A and B. Now again, when you combine sets, the result is also a set. And as such, if the two sets have common elements, we only keep one copy because a set only has one of each unique type. So we have set union, the combination, we have intersection, what's common, and here's intersection in the upper right-hand corner as a Venn diagram. We have complement, so this is A, and A bar is everything that's not in A, right? Now you can also compute A bar if you take the universe, in this case, our universe is sample space omega because that's everything that's observable. Now if A is one subset of that, so let's say you roll a die and you're talking about the even outcome. So omega is one, two, three, four, five, six. And then let's say A, the evens, is two, four, six. So A bar would be omega with a set minus, or complement, uh, omega minus uh, what's in A. So one, two, three, four, five, six, that set. If you remove two, four, and six, you're left with one, three, and five, right? So set complement can be mechanically computed by taking our omega and subtracting out that thing that you're producing the complement on. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? All right. So then we also have set difference. This is set difference. A difference B, it kind of looks like a weird divided by with the divided in the wrong direction, right? Um, and that's everything in A that's not in B. So if you take A, you look at what's common to A and B, and you subtract out what's common between the two. What's left is A difference B, set difference. Okay. Any questions about this? Make sense? Yes. Pardon? 
Ah. Um, exclusive or is A bar B, A, A bar and B chord with B bar and A. It's a little bit different. It takes what is, um, what is different between the two. Uh, so you can actually construct uh, exclusive or. Exclusive or is often drawn as a plus with the uh, circle over it. So if you had A, X, X or B, that's A bar B chord with B bar A. So that's everything that's in B but not in A, uh, uh, or with everything that's not in B and with A. And so then diagrammatically, if this is A and this is B, that's this region and this region is the exclusive order. So it's a little bit different from the set difference. It's related, but it's a little bit different because if this were A exclusive or B, you'd also have that section included. Okay? All right. Any other questions? Okay. So let's do an exercise. Suppose you had, and I apologize again for writing on the board, um, trying to fix these uh, issues with the network. I have no idea what we're going to do, honestly. But we'll see if it'll be fixed by uh, Thursday. So let's say you had omega die, right? And omega die, we just said is one, two, three, four, five, six. So let's say you had an event, and that event E is equal to, and I should end here soon, uh, not odd and at the same time greater than greater than 2. Okay, so what does not odd mean in terms of this sample space, right? So we have a Venn diagram and it's going to be hard for everyone in the back to see. One, two, three, four, five, six. What does not odd mean? Well, you could say odd, odd, and put a bar over it. So what does not odd mean? Two, four, six. All right, so not odd says everything that's outside of the odds. So odds are one, three, five. Not odd would be two, four, six. Okay. So let's, I only have black here, so I'll do the dotted line to represent the other set. And at the same time, greater than two, all right? So greater than two, what is greater than two? Is three, four, five, six. So three, four, five, six in the dotted line here. It's kind of hard to see. Um, okay, so if I said not odd, which is two, four, six, and greater than two, which is uh, three, four, five, six, when it's really big, it's harder to see. Um, so if I have the end of these two, what would that be? It would be four and six, greater than two, and four and six, so it's where they overlap. So let me just draw a clean one here. One, two, three, four, five, six. It would just be four and six because it's not odd and it's greater than two at the same time. Okay, great. So we have available to us uh, all of the set operations and we need those set operations in order to construct more complex events, right? And we can certainly do that. Uh, so we're gonna make use of some of the stuff from uh, the street now. All right, so let me check the time. Time is now, and my watch is fast, so I like to make sure I get the telephone company time one away. Uh, so we have seven more minutes. So let's end with this one. Um, suppose, and this is a question for you, uh, it's important to learn the quote unquote set language. Let's say we have this idea of something bar, right? Something bar is equal to nothing. Hmm. Let's unpack that. What does something mean in set notation? Something. So if I had my sample space omega, and let's, for the sake of example, assume it was the value over here. Something, something. What is something? I've got to get something. 
I'm going to get one of these outcomes. Okay. So something is the same as saying omega dot. One, two, three, four, five, or six. What is something bar? Means something bar. Opposite. So how would I say the opposite? So if I said something, something is one, two, three, four, five, or six. So if I say not something, I just erased the four, what is that? None of them. Nothing. And how I say nothing in set notation is empty. Right? So what if I said not everything? Not everything in set notation. If I have omega, my universe is one, two, three, four, five, six. Not everything means that if I have everything, that's the whole sample space omega. Not everything means I'm just shy of everything. So that means I either have two, three, four, five, six, one, three, four, five, six. I take out one of them. That's not everything, right? So not everything bar is the same as saying at least one. Because if my not everything did not include the one, if I take the complement of that, that's just the one. If my not everything did not include the two, my complement of that is just the two, right? So from a set language perspective, not everything bar is the same as saying at least one. And so, so I'd like for you to start to get an intuitive feel, particularly using things like the die roll and the point talk, with different types of concepts you could express. And at one point for a project, I'm gonna have you design a game and pick a decent wager and analyze if the game is winnable, if the house makes money, what the house is supposed to do. Okay? All right, any questions about this? No? All right, so let's end there and we'll pick back up next time uh, and finish the module. I'll see you all on uh, Thursday.